right, so I welcome you tonight. Glad that you're here for questioning and answering uh, night of Heaven Bible Study. Thank you for those of you that are watching online, and I want to remind you, you can go to our website, uh, rightbaptist.org, and you can download all the study notes from the past 12 weeks, and, uh, or you can call our church office, area code 850-862-4123. But tonight is about uh, Q&A, question and answering, and the questions have been submitted by email, and if there's time left over at the end of our night, then I'll entertain questions from you guys, but I want to be fair and go through the questions that were submitted to me first, and let's see if we can't cover those. I will repeat the question, and then I will um, give you my thoughts. If you have a thought or you want to interject something, I just ask that you keep it short. Please don't tell a story. Reason being, I can repeat after you if you give an insight or two, but if you tell a long story, I'm not going to be able to, to do that, and it'll be very awkward for our listeners, either by uh, online or, or listening by CD, Okay. So anyway, let me point you uh, to the guiding principles for tonight's discussion. And I've asked that they stay on the screen the whole night so you can just reference those throughout the night. First of all, we have to remember heaven is about gaining, not losing. Okay, so whatever question you have about what life will be like in heaven, just remember heaven is about gaining and not losing. Guiding principle number two, anything that is not a result of the fall can carry over to heaven. Will it? That's up to God, but it can. Okay? Guiding principle number three, just because something is meant figuratively in God's word uh, in one place or two places or ten places doesn't mean everything in the Bible is meant figuratively. Is that fair enough? So we can look at something in scripture and we can say, well, this scripture is, or this story is uh, a metaphor for this. And we would be correct in saying that. But that doesn't mean that the Bible uh, is not full of concrete images and things that it's talking about, really is talking about real-life events, real-life people, and, and so forth. So just because something is meant figuratively in, in one place doesn't necessarily mean everything in the Bible should be taken figuratively or allegorically. Okay? And then a lot of places in the Bible can absolutely have double meaning. There can be real-life people in real-life events that Jesus talks about and he can make a spiritual um, connection to that, a life principle from that story. And we do that today. I mean, even when we're teaching our children, you know, when we're teaching them about honesty or we're teaching them about good work ethic, um, maybe we'll reference something in our own life. We'll say to our child, you know, when I was your age, I had this opportunity, this is what happened, and here's what I learned. I learned to be honest. I learned that truth is always the best policy. I learned, you know, to respect authority, et cetera, et cetera. So... We do the same thing Jesus did. He would tell stories, and just because they were a parable or a story that he was trying to uh, teach a greater principle does not mean that that story didn't really happen. All right, so there are three guiding principles for tonight. So here's what I want to do. I'm not going to identify those of you that, that, answer, or excuse me, that asked the questions. I'm not going to identify you. But if I read your question and uh, it was not to your satisfactory, I'm not answering the question you really posed, or maybe I misinterpreted your question, and you don't mind speaking up, you can say, no, that was my question, here's what I really meant. Okay, but I'm not going to identify you. You can identify you, but I'm not going to. Everybody good? All right, let's dive in. This person writes, um, and I'm putting the questions in my own words, but basically here's, here's what this person wrote. Of the millions of people, how will we find loved ones? This person cited a family member that lived back in the Civil War time, and then it cited a, a, another family dynamic. So, of, But essentially, the question is, of all the people in heaven that you want to see, okay, relatives who have died, friends who have died, we all understand that when we get to heaven, there's going to be a lot of people there, so how will we find them? I believe even today, we need to look at how do we find people today? What are some ways we find people today? We, yeah, we just, what would you say? Facebook. Therefore, there will be Facebook in heaven. And everybody will be friends. And everybody will like what you say. And share what you say. And anyway, um, we have ways here on earth to find people that, that have been out of our life. Mutual 
friends, connections, uh, good grief, the sky's the limit, conventions, uh, places you go where, where uh, large groups of people meet, and then you start talking and comparing stories, and you find out, wow, we're from the same hometown. Wow, did you know, you know John Smith? Oh, yeah, I grew up with John Smith. Well, he was my granddad. That happens here on earth. Guys, if it can happen here on earth in a sin-polluted world, of course that can happen in heaven. And remember, we're not bound by time in heaven. We have an eternity to explore that. So my, my answer is, will you find your loved ones? Yes. Will it happen immediately as soon as you, know, you leave this life and you go to heaven? Boom, there's everybody you've ever wanted to see. I can't say that. Maybe it will. Maybe God will have that orchestrated. Maybe that will be your welcoming party. Okay? But even today here on earth, we have tangible ways of finding people that we've lost connection with. Everybody would agree with that? So, of course, we're going to have that in heaven. Mutual friends, connections. We're going to investigate. I mean, even here on earth, we investigate. We hunt down. Okay? Why not do that in heaven? We have time. We're going to have the opportunity to do that. So, uh, or maybe Jesus introduces you. God knows your need. Okay? And God is a, is a God who wants to meet your needs. And so if that is a need for you to know uh, a relative that's gone on, and, and God knows that is your need when you first get to heaven, I have a feeling he's going to make that happen. All right? Second question, how will I know this person? How will I know my family? Well, how do you know family here on earth? We're connected. I mean, we, have the, we share DNA. And I've heard stories here on earth where twins were separated or siblings were separated at birth. And then they found one another later in, the adult, in adult life and uh, recognized one another. Okay, that's just the power of DNA that God puts in us. We are connected to our family. Remember, when we get to heaven, we're going to be what? Family. Okay, so it's not too hard for me to grasp uh, how it will happen specifically. I can't say, but it's not too hard for me to grasp that we will just, we will know. Jesus said this, uh, my sheep hear my voice and they what? They know me. My sheep hear me and they know me. So maybe when you get to heaven, you're going to hear a loved one's voice. You're going to know. Even if you didn't meet them on earth, God's going to give you the ability to know them. Okay? None of us have known Jesus as he was a human walking the earth. Right? But yet Jesus declared, my sheep know me, and they, or hear me, and they know me. Do you think you'll recognize Jesus when we get to heaven? Absolutely. You think you'll hear his voice and know that's him? Absolutely. So why couldn't that carry over into your loved ones? Okay? When I was small and playing Little League, um, I can remember hearing my mom's voice, my parents' voice in the stands, okay? I could hear, go son, and there were, you know, a ton of us out on the field, okay? And all the parents were shouting, stuff, <laughs> depending on the parent. My parents were nice, and they shouted good things, but I, I could distinguish my mom's voice out of a crowd, okay? And she could mime. I could say, mom, there were 30 million moms in the stands, right? But my mom answered me. Why? Because my sheep hear my voice and they know me. So I do believe that will carry over into heaven. Will you know your loved ones? Yes. Specifically, I think there are many ways that can happen. And then the third question was, will there be an instant bonding uh, slash relationship with our loved ones who are in heaven that maybe we did not meet on earth, okay? And I put, well, we need to separate the bonding and the relationship. Will there be an instant bonding? Perhaps, because you're family. And again, we've, seen, we've heard stories of people here on earth who met after being separated for years and years and years and years, and they immediately bonded, okay? Relationship takes a lifetime to build. So in heaven, we have a, a, an eternity, to build that relationship. So will there be a bonding? Yes, I believe so. And then let's think one level greater. In heaven, we're all the family of God. What bonds us together? The love of Christ. Okay, so will we, will we be bonded? Yes. Let me give you an earthly example. When you meet a believer this side of heaven, do you not feel an instant bonding with this person? Yeah. You don't know them. You might not even know their last name, but there's a there's something about them you connect to. You, you immediately bond to them. Why? Because the Holy Spirit in them and the Holy Spirit in you is, is what you're feeling. You're feeling that bonding, okay, of where two or three are gathered, then God's there, etc. So bonding, yes. 
Relationship, I think it takes a while to build, and you'll have plenty of time in heaven in the perfect environment. That's a beautiful thing. Um, and then there was one more question uh, submitted by this person. Will a, uh, a family member know another family member, even though um, one died at a very old age? And uh, so in, essentially the question is this. How will our family recognize us if when they left, uh, when we left this earth, we were old? How will they see us in heaven? How will they recognize us? And that's, several of you had that question, kind of. So I, I just took you back to part nine. What will our bodies be like? So let me, in fairness to uh, the question, let me go back to part nine real quick and, um, and just read a couple of things just to, just to uh, jog our memory. What will our bodies be like? I wrote here, this is a very popular question. We've already established that we will be resurrected physical beings. We've established that, we'll f- that we will feel, that we'll have emotions, we'll have holy desires. Um, we will be a uh, renewed, remade image of, of who we are now. Okay. Again, guiding principle number one, heaven is about gaining, not losing. Okay. So when we think about what our bodies will be like, we're only going to gain. We're not going to lose our identity. We're not going to lose features that give us our identity. Um, so what will our bodies be like? I believe they'll be beautiful because they're going to be resurrected. They're going to be glorified. They're not going to be tainted by sin. Okay. Um, then we have to define beauty. What is beauty? Okay. Because I think there are many beautiful people in my life that maybe the world would look at and say they're not pretty. Okay. So I define beauty a whole lot differently than than maybe other people, and I bet you do too. Okay, so will we be beautiful? Yes, but let's define beauty. Um, we're going to have the capacity to love and to, re- and to receive love with no sin, no ulterior motive, no selfishness, no lust, none of that stuff. And, and we can't really fully grasp that, this side of heaven, but what we can understand is um, we will have perfect bodies in a glorified state, but a body is still what? A body. Okay? Flesh and blood is what we understand a body to be. We understand a spirit to be one thing. We understand a body to be one. The resurrected Jesus had both. And so I think our body will be patterned after Jesus' body because he's our model for life, death, and resurrection. We'll still have unique, our uniqueness, and I'm talking about our racial features or ethnic uh, features, uh, you know, speech. You know, I, I'll have the same accent I believe in heaven. Thank God, because it's the only right one. <laughs> Everybody else talks weird. Um, you know, I'm not going to go to heaven and then all of a sudden start speaking in an Australian accent, right? That'd just be weird. So I believe you'll carry over into heaven your uniqueness and the things that, that identify you because that's you. Um, so I hope I answered that question okay as far as if I, let me just use me and, and my child as an example. If God allows me to live to be 90, and then I die, and Miranda's on up into her 30s and buries me, or 40s, or however old she'll be, older than that. What was I, 30, 20, 30 when she was born? So I got to do my math real quick. So if I'm 90 and she's 60 burying me, you know, she remembers me as an old wrinkled man at 90 years old. You know, when we get to heaven, is she going to look for an old wrinkled man? I don't think so. I think she's going to look for her daddy with the same distinguishing features that I had when I was young, okay? Maybe just not marred by time and gravity and sin and all the things that our 90-year-old bodies carry. Um, so anyway, hope that, hope that satisfied that. Uh, next question, next email. This was pretty simple. Um, this person wrote that their child, adult child, has been married twice and wants to know if both her spouses, um, when they make it to heaven, will they know what their relationship was like? Yes, because many of you have lost your first spouse and you have remarried. Do I think your spouse will know who you are and what role you played in this life in heaven? Yes, and I believe your second spouse will too. But we have to understand that's really the question that was posed to Jesus about the, uh, the black widow, right? the woman who married seven brothers. Um, She marries, he dies, she marries his brother, he dies. Remember this? That was the question posed to Jesus. 
Who, who's, uh, whose wife will she be in heaven? And Jesus said, you're missing the point. And that's where he made his declaration about there being no marriage in heaven. In that lesson that we were in, uh, talking about relationships and marriage, we have to remember marriage is a signpost. It is pointing to the relationship between Jesus and the church. What defines a marriage from any other relationship on earth, whether it's your first marriage or your second marriage, or if, you know, if you've been unfortunate enough to bury two spouses and now it's your third, uh, which I've had people in my church uh, on their third marriage because of, of death. Um, it, it, regardless of, of the number of spouses, um, that marriage, what separates it from every other relationship is the intimacy that you enjoy with your marriage partner. At least it should be. That's why adultery is so wrong. So the intimacy, the complete trust, the knowing one another and yet choosing to love every day, okay? That's what makes a marriage a marriage different from a friendship. You take your best friend in the world, that still is not as, that's still a relationship that's not as intimate as your marriage, okay? Or at least it shouldn't be. So our marriage is a signpost pointing to the marriage relationship or the relationship between Jesus and the church intimacy, knowing one another fully, and loving one another freely, okay? The mechanisms that God allows on earth for that to take place, one of those dynamics in a marriage is the sexual relationship, the physical relationship. It serves a purpose on earth that is not needed in heaven. So can God still uh, uh, maintain a, a relationship with intimacy in heaven? Yes. Doesn't necessarily mean he needs the same faculties he used on earth. Okay, so will this person's uh, grown child know the relationship with the spouses? Yes, and will they know? Yes, just like you. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? Okay. Um, and I believe, you know, if, if I die and Kristen remarries, um, when we all get to heaven, our love, and please don't miss this, our eros, okay, that's the romantic loves, where we get our word erotic, melds into agape. And so for all of us, our eros that we share with our spouse goes one level higher to agape. That's the godly form of love. So there's no selfishness. There's no jealousy. There's no, get your hand off my man, he's mine. There's none of that, okay? No selfishness, no jealousy. And um, um, anyway, so I hope that answer that satisfactorily. Okay, this is a good one. Well, they're all good. They're all good, but okay. Shut up, Gates. Just keep going. Here we go. This person wrote, um, in Luke chapter 20, verses 27 through 36, I have a question about marrying and a question about angels. And verse 35, Jesus talked about uh, that they will neither marry let me just go there so I can put it in context for you. But anyway, it was the conversation I was just telling you about where they tried to trap Jesus on the marriage question and the, and the black widow. But let me read it to you in, in context, okay? Uh, Luke 20. And, of course, it was the conversation between the Sadducees. But I'm skipping down to verse 35. Jesus replied, verse 34, The people of this age... Marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age, talking about the age yet to come, and in the resurrection from the dead, will neither marry nor be given in marriage. Verse 36, and they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. Okay, so this question is, uh, does that mean that we will not marry or be married to our spouse in heaven? Yes, that's what that means. It means that the marriage relationship that we enjoy on earth goes one level higher to agape in heaven. We've covered that. Remember, the human signpost and the bride being married to Jesus, the intimacy and all that. But the second part of the question is, verse 36, for they are like angels. Does that mean Christians are like angels? I thought you said that we wouldn't be like angels floating around on a cloud playing a harp. And I appreciated the humor in this email. I'm leaving stuff out. But let me read it to you in context, okay? Okay. Um, Jesus replied, the people of this age uh, marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy 
have taken part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children since they are children of the resurrection. Okay, to be like something and to be something are two different things. Jesus isn't saying we're going to go to heaven and turn into an angel. Look what he's saying right before it. And they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. Okay? So, you know, we have sayings down here like, uh, you have a memory like an elephant. Okay? You have beautiful eyes like a doe. Okay? That doesn't mean you're an elephant. doesn't mean you're a doe. It just means you can share characteristics with something. Okay? Um, so, I believe in context, don't get hung up on just like the angels. That's not talking about in essence. Everybody with me? That's very important. Because yes, I did say we do not turn into angels. Humans are humans here on earth. Humans will always be humans. Angels are angels. Angels will always be angels. Okay? Second question was uh, in, re in reference to the marriage of the Lamb that it talks about in Revelation chapter 19. Um, this person writes, I'm assuming that those who are invited to, to the, uh, the marriage ceremony or uh, to the feast are part of the bride who has clothed herself in fine linen. Who else would be invited to the marriage? That's talking about the church, the bride, the redeemed. Okay? In that context in Revelation, it is talking about the believer in Jesus Christ, those who are redeemed, whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life. There would be no one else. Okay? And then Revelation 21, great question. Um, and he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Does this mean that tears will not be wiped away until after the thousand years reign and after the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls of wrath are poured out? Is revelation in chronological order? There will be a lot of crying in heaven if that's the case, don't you think? Okay, without getting too diverted right now in a, a study on end times and the millennial reign and what all that means, because I'm going to do that, let me just answer it simply. The, the injustice is done before Revelation 21, 1 is what Jesus will heal and wipe tears away from our eyes regarding, okay? All the injustices that you read happening even right now in our day and in Revelation. The wiping away tear from our eyes does not mean that heaven right now is this horribly sad place where everybody's in a cry fest, but we do get glimpses of heaven right now in the intermediate heaven where there are martyrs gathered around the throne crying out to God about the injustices on earth. Okay? Crying is not a, a punishment. Crying is not uh, uh, a curse. It is a normal, natural emotion that we experience on earth. Crying can actually be very healthy. Okay? And... Um, so, crying in heaven is, should not be such a, a thought that makes you think heaven's going to be sad because we can cry on earth and notice injustices on earth without, without it completely wrecking our quality of life. Would you agree with that? We all acknowledge there's injustices on earth happening right now. Is that going to prevent you from going home and enjoying dinner with your family or going home and, and going on a vacation with your family and enjoying that time together? No. So you have the capacity to still have a full, quality, meaningful life here, yet know that there are injustices happening right under, our, right under our, the shadow of our steeple. And, and there are times we do give that special attention and we do understand and we cry. But I believe the, the point in Revelation is that Jesus will right all wrongs. Okay, and um, so I hope that's satisfactory to that question. I don't think there's a lot of crying in heaven in the sense of if you went to a funeral home right now and went into a, a viewing room where there was family gathered around and the weeping and wailing. I don't think there's that picture of heaven. But yes, I do believe there's emotion in heaven, and some of that emotion does involve crying. I think it was, I can't remember what part it was. I'd have to go back and look at my notes and I won't waste time doing it now, but, but there was a, a, a quote that I read from Randy Alcorn's book where the, the crying or the feeling of injustices that we see taking place, that emotion that we have in heaven will not be, uh, or it will be uh, certainly real, but our joy in heaven, it will not take away from our joy in heaven, okay? 
I probably just stumbled all over that. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Okay, next question. <clears throat> uh, in John 14, 2, the Bible says, In my Father's house are many mansions. Why do you think we will live in... I'm excuse, excuse me. Who do you think we will live with in heaven? I know there are no marriages in heaven. Um, will we live with anyone that is our earthly family, or will we all have separate mansions? Will we all live together in our Father's house, or will we, need, will we even need a physical dwelling place? Very good question. John 14, 2, Jesus states these words, and I want, again, to do it fairness, I want to read it in context real quickly. Um, what, what is Jesus doing in John 14? Well, he's comforting his disciples, okay? He's lending them words of comfort. So if we back up, John 14, 1, Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, dwelling places, mansions, depending on what translation you're reading. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. So in context, Jesus is comforting his disciples. He's not necessarily, um, uh, his intent is to comfort. His intent is not necessarily to show you what the blueprint of your house is going to look like. Okay? Um, he's not necessarily giving a detailed description of your specific dwelling place. As much as I think he's trying to emphasize that there really is a heaven, there really is a dwelling place, and he refers to heaven as my father's house. In my father's house are many mansions. In Revelation 13, 6, it says that heaven is God's dwelling place. So if we can understand that uh, the father's house is heaven, then what Jesus is trying to say is there really is a heaven, and I'm going there, and when I get there, I'm going to work on a place for you to come and live with me. And then I'm going to come back and receive you unto myself. His message was, guys, don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm the real deal, and what I'm going to do is the real deal. You can put your hope right in these words, okay? Um, now, specifically, will we live with anyone? Well, let me answer it this way. I don't think we'll be lonely, okay? Some of you, to live with someone or in a commune would not be your idea of heaven. Some of you enjoy your solitude. Some of you enjoy your own dwelling place. For others of you, depending on how you're shaped, Temper, uh, temper, temperately, uh, the thought of being living in your own dwelling place by yourself would be a nightmare. You want people with you and in your house with you. Again, heaven is about, principle number one, heaven is about gaining, not losing. Okay? So if, that, if you need a bunch of people around you uh, in your house, then God probably knows that, and he probably knows other people who have that need. Okay? Me... I'll see you out in the front yard, okay? But I like having my own dwelling place. I like being left alone. I am melancholy. Part of my temperament is melancholy. And y'all don't see much of that because I, you see another part of me. But at home, I am melancholy unless I'm videoing a Disney video with my daughter. <laughs> um, but I do enjoy quiet time. I do, at the end of the day, my precious wife will tell you, I'm out of words. And I love to just sit and do nothing. And uh, so... Many of you are the same way, especially if you're in an occupation where you're in front of people and you talk a lot, you need that time to regenerate. So, yes, it does not bother me at all to know that when I get to heaven, whether I have my own house and no one's in the house with me, I, I think I'm at least going to have a place where I can chill out for a while. That'd be awesome, okay? Uh, will we need a physical dwelling place? That was the question. Yes, because if you don't think we'll need a physical dwelling place, Jesus wasted time saying it to his disciples, and we may not understand the physical reality of heaven. So if you understand your resurrected body is a physical body, you need a place, right? You need a dwelling place. Now, what will we do in those dwelling places? Will we do the same thing in those dwelling places that we do on earth in our dwelling places? Chances are not, or not everything, okay? But I do believe some of the things that we will need um, up there or in heaven will need to take place in a dwelling place. For instance, we, the Bible says we're going to eat. The Bible says we're going to fellowship. We're going to rest. We're going to relax. We're going to hone a skill or hobby. We're going to have possessions. Aren't we joint heirs with Jesus? We're going to have possessions. All those things speak to a, a dwelling place. We need a dwelling place for this stuff. Okay? So, yes. 
I believe we will need one. Excellent question. But remember, Jesus' words were about, were about comforting his disciples with the reality of heaven. This uh, person writes, uh, it, this, this comes from a mother who lost a baby. And I've gotten this question from two or three different mothers every time I've done this study. The mother who lost the baby wants to know, will I know my child? Even though they were, uh, uh, I never knew them here on earth. They were dead before I was able to be their mother or give them life and have life with them here on earth. Yes. Short answer is yes. Okay. Again, heaven is about gaining. So if you lost that relationship on earth, heaven's about gaining. And I believe you'll gain that relationship. Um, Will there be a mother-child bond? I believe there will be a bond. Okay. I believe we will be family. And I believe that child will know you were its mother on earth. Okay. Just like children that we've raised and that we proceed in death. I think the same principle applies. And again, we'll have an eternity to nurture that relationship. So I hope that uh, those of you who've had miscarriages or those of you who've lost children in an untimely death, um, I, I hope that comforts you. Okay, heaven's about gaining and not about losing. And I believe you'll have a beautiful opportunity in heaven to, uh, to nurture that relationship. One, now, it'll look different in heaven. It won't have any sin. It won't have any ulterior motives. It won't have any, don't make me tell you again, go clean your room. It won't have any of that, right? So that's, that's the good news. And you'll be free to love one another and to love freely. And um, I think that's a beautiful thing. Okay. This question comes from several different parts of our discussion. But question one is referencing Abraham's, uh, the, the, vi- the vision of Abraham uh, holding Lazarus in his bosom and the, the rich man in torment, and Jesus' telling of that story. So I want to go ahead and turn there. If you're, if you're interested to follow along with me, you certainly can. Luke chapter 16, and I'm in verse 22. Actually, the story begins with verse 19. Okay, and the question is, is this description, Abraham's bosom, his side. Is it figurative or literal? Well, remembering principle number three, um, there's no reason why it couldn't be both. But part two of our discussion, or of our notes, uh, let me read, well, let me get to part two first. And I, one, two, three, I made myself a note to go back and read this. The story of the rich man and Lazarus has much to teach us about the physical properties in the afterlife. While components of this story may be figurative, Jesus certainly used concrete details for us to picture people in the afterlife as real humans with thoughts and capacities, and with the same identity, memories, and awareness from their lives lived on earth. If... We, uh, some would argue that this story is not even a parable, okay? But it was actual, an, it was an actual account uh, of an event. It's interesting. No other parable mentions a name, but in this story, there's a name mentioned. Which one? Lazarus. Now it's interesting because the rich man is only identified as the rich man. He lost his identity in hell, okay? Which hell is about losing. Everything heaven is about gaining. Including our identity, hell's about losing. So we're not even given a name to this man. But we are given Lazarus' name. Why? Because he still had an identity, okay? With a history and, and memories and all that. And he's being comforted. He's being rewarded. So it's interesting that no other parable Jesus uses a name. Here he's telling a story. And he's using a very, he's using a name, Lazarus. Now that word immediately, if you have read the Bible at all, strikes an image of Jesus' friend that he raised from the dead. Now, is it the same Lazarus? No, because Lazarus was raised from the dead. This man, Lazarus, was in Abraham's bosom. So the thought is, if Jesus was just telling a story about something that didn't really happen, why didn't he just use another name? Why would he use Lazarus, a name that could easily be confused with his friend Lazarus? Okay. Um, in context, though, he, even, he doesn't even set up this story like a parable. Okay, just in your general knowledge of Jesus' teaching, you've, you can remember him introing his parables 
in several different ways, right? Like, the kingdom of heaven is like a man goes to sow a seed. Or he sets up a parable like, many of you have heard it said this, but I tell you a new whatever. And then he tells a story, okay? Notice, there is no intro. There's no setup. He, he, matter of fact, let me read it to you in context. In Luke 16, he's teaching, okay? He starts off what we call Luke 16. Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So it's interesting. He's telling a story about a, a, a shrewd rich man, okay? So he's just telling a story. And then verse 16, he goes on down, verse 16, the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached, and everyone is forcing his way into it. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery, and the man who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And this is Jesus, okay? This is Jesus talking just additional teachings about the law. Then he goes right into, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day, and at his gate was a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat. Now, understanding that in Jesus' audience were rich people, religious leaders, people who treated the poor poorly, who overlooked the needs of people who were begging, knowing those kinds of people were in Jesus' audience, he was very, very... Um, intentional about what he was teaching to whom he was teaching and what he was including in his teaching and so I happen to believe that when he starts telling this story he's really bringing to mind a real guy named Lazarus who really was a beggar who many people really did overlook I don't think it was a parable that he just drew from his creative juices to give an example now what's the point of all that because if this story were simply figurative, I believe Jesus would have set it up more like he did other parables, okay? The parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. Also understanding that parables didn't necessarily mean they were real life events like the prodigal son. Did that really happen? We don't know. Could have. But Jesus doesn't identify the characters in that story. He, he speaks in vague terms and his point was, I don't really care that you know the name of the young man. I just care that you know that's all of us when we stray from God. And God is the good father who, bring, who welcomes us back when we come to him, right? So, but I believe his point about the uh, rich man and Lazarus is really to demonstrate to, his, to his, not only his disciples, but his audience. Hey, there are people who are being overlooked. And remember, there is an afterlife. And uh, let me give you a story. Let me show you what I'm talking about. We all remember Lazarus, right? Remember how you used to pass by him? Well, guess what? He's in heaven now, and he's got his reward. So, is it figurative? Sure. But I don't think that takes away from the fact that it's also literal. Question two. If, if figurative, does this indicate to us that the Bible frequently uses earthly descriptions to illustrate heavenly things in the ways that we humans can understand? Absolutely. And I put, could it be? Yes. It does mean that. But we just have to be careful, guiding principle number three, that we not allegorize everything simply because an isolated or a few things we can find in the Bible that strictly just have uh, an allegory uh, message. Okay, and then related to session eight notes. According to Genesis and Ezekiel, it's a great question. I enjoyed going back to my notes and looking on this one to make sure I had my, uh, my uh, notes right. <clears throat> According to Genesis and Ezekiel, these stones, talking about the onyx stones that the priest wore on their shoulders and it had the names of the 12 tribes, six names, six names of the 12, tri the, uh, 12 tribes of Israel on their, the priestly garment. Uh, that's what this is referencing. God wanted his people to remember Eden. And this person is quoting from the notes in session 8. The question is, what specific passages indicate these stones memorialized Eden? Exodus indicates the stones simply memorialized the 12 tribes. Um, I would agree with that, but I also think the fact that these stones were from the land of uh, Havilah, which we're told over in Ezekiel, and by the way, not that you have your, probably you don't have your notes with you, but this is in part eight, and there was a typo I found, and I, I can't believe I didn't correct it when we did that, but I cited in part eight the book, from, uh, the book of Ezekiel, and I put Ezekiel two, well, I left out an eight. It was Ezekiel 28. 
So if you were going through your scripture and notes, you probably wondered, what in the world was he speaking of? Here's what I wrote. Eden was not just a garden. It was an entire land of natural wonders. Genesis 2, 11 and 12 says the Pishon River, originating in Eden, flowed through the entire land of Havilah. The Bible goes on to say that the land had gold, aromatic resin, and onyx. And here's what I said in your notes. Ezekiel 2.13 reminds us, but it should be 28.13, okay? So I apologize. Ezekiel 28.13 reminds us that the precious onyx stone was located not only near Eden, but in Eden. Okay. So uh, let me read my chicken scratch here to make sure I'm going to answer this. Uh, I think that's significant. These stones come from the land... um, where the Bible says it was in Eden. These stones were in Eden. If we look at the temple, if we look at the Ark of the Covenant, if we look at the priestly garments, everything in that points to uh, God and his character and redemption, right? Uh, in, In the Old Testament, the Old Testament tabernacle, is, is foreshadowing, we learn this even in the story, is a foreshadowing of Jesus. And the Holy of Holies is a foreshadowing of you and me, the temple of God. Okay, so that when Jesus said it is finished, the Bible says the temple veil was torn in two, right? And that wasn't God coming out as much as it was saying you can do what? Enter in, okay? So everything in the Old Testament points to the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, but the redemptive work of Jesus Christ points to perfection and restoring and restoration of what we once uh, enjoyed in Eden. And so I believe the onyx stones, while yes, they do memorialize the tribes, I do uh, believe the stones themselves coming from, and uh, being even told in God's word, they were from Eden, uh, put that right in front of the people's face. So let me use, this may be a silly example, but let me just throw this out. Um, if, well, even today, I'll I'll just tell you a real life thing, and I should have brought it over for a a prop, and I didn't, but I think I've shown you before. Um, but Kristen's grandmother was around Miranda's age right now when Hitler took over Nazi Germany and and all that, uh, happened. So, uh, years later, she got to go back as, obviously, as an adult after the Berlin Wall came down. And she got a piece of the Berlin Wall and gave it to Kristen and me. And so we, I have in my office um, a piece of the Berlin Wall. Well, if you just saw the wall, if you just saw the, the hunk of rock, it would just, to you, just be a rock. I'd have to tell you what it was in order for you to appreciate it. Because you wouldn't be able to distinguish it. You, you, know, you wouldn't be like, ooh, that looks like the, the Berlin Wall. Unless you've been to the Berlin Wall, and still that wouldn't do anything. Because it's just a hunk of concrete. But once I told you... Um, the story behind it, you would have a different appreciation, right? So when I look at the piece of rock, I immediately can appreciate what it is and what it memorializes. Does that make sense? Okay, so in a way, I believe that's what the onyx stones did for the priestly garments. Okay, it's not like they had to be told, oh, by the way, see these two stones? Okay, I believe it just helps signify what they once enjoyed, enjoyed in Eden and that this was a carryover from. Then we're told in Revelation these same stones are going to be in the foundation of the holy city. And I just believe that's God's way of, of showing us continuity. In Eden, on the priestly garment that he was to wear in making atonement for sin, 12 tribes of Israel, which was fulfilling God's promise with Abraham in, in um, uh, carrying out his plan for his people, which then in the New Testament extended to you and me, okay, which will eventually... Get us all in heaven where we belong. Okay. So I just took you from Genesis to Revelation in 15 seconds. All right. But you see the progression, right? And how everything points to the next thing, points to the next thing, points to the next thing. Okay. So I hope that helps. Um, Let me read you real quick. I wanted to read to you the person who wrote this question, but I'm sure several of you uh, perhaps had that question. Let me read to you some additional scripture just real quick to to draw you a tie between Eden and these people uh, that saw the priestly garments. Okay. 
Indeed, the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places, and her wilderness he will make like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and a sound of melody. That's from Isaiah. Uh, from Ezekiel, they will say, This desolate land has become like the garden of Eden, and the waste, desolate, and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. From Isaiah 35, the wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Isaiah 55, instead of the thorn shall come up from the cypress tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. Um, commenting on such passages, theologian Anthony Hokima writes, Prophecies of this nature should be understood as descriptions of the new earth, which God will bring into existence after Christ comes again. A new earth which will last, not just 4,000 years, but forever. Keeping the doctrine of the new earth in mind will open up the meaning of large portions of the Old Testament prophetic literature in surprising, surprisingly new ways. Okay. Now, everybody doing good? All right. Let me now get to... This person who wrote a question, questions, it's actually several pages. So you who wrote this, I'm going to do my best to cover everything, okay? If she did not cover a question or ask a question that you've had, I'll be surprised because I really enjoyed this, and I think it covers a lot of questions, even from my past studies doing heaven with people. Uh, this person had quite a few, so it was awesome. Let me dig in. Here we go. Section 2, part 2, I'm assuming, intermediate heaven. Um, not talked about in the pre-post-rapture existence. Is the intermediate heaven destroyed after the millennium, or is it totally different? And, and really, the person's wanting to know a timeline. Again, without getting into an end-time study, we're going to do that. We're going to go through that. Um, I purposely did not touch on pre-post, millennial, and all that, but let me just answer it simply. I believe the immediate heaven, the intermediate heaven, uh, ends at Revelation 21, and the new heaven, new earth, begins Revelation 21. And again, it's that simple verse. John said, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth has, had passed away. Okay, so I believe that's the, the point where that happens. Okay? Um, is the earth a copy of what is in heaven? Yes. Uh, the assumption was made, is the Garden of Eden still on the earth? No, we don't know where the Garden of Eden is. The Bible just says that God took it away, we can't get there, and he's got his angels guarding it, okay? Um, God can put it anywhere he wants. I don't personally believe it's on planet earth. But again, that's, there are others who would disagree, okay? But I do believe, I do know what the Bible says, and that is that he removed our capability of being able to go there and see it and enjoy it. And it's guarded, okay? Um, in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, the, uh, the word, the, the verse was uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And uh, this person wanted to know what the Greek word, and I'm assuming you wanted to know what the Greek word for present is, present with the Lord. Uh, Indomeo is the Greek word, and it means to be in one's own country or to be in one's own home. And a different translation of the Bible, of 2 Corinthians 5.8, actually words it like that. You know, to be uh, absent from this life and to be at home with the Lord. Okay, so it really carries with it the idea to be where you belong. That's the, the word that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians in speaking of once this life ends, once death happens, to be absent from this body is to be at home where we belong in the presence of the Lord. Okay. Um, how, will we, how will we rule, say that three times fast, how will we rule in God's kingdom? It's going to look like servanthood. It's going to look like ministry, okay? We talked about that significantly in, in part seven, I believe. Uh, remember the original job description for man. What was mankind's original job description? Manage my creation. That was work. It was a responsibility. It carried with it leadership, but it was full of joy. It was a privilege. It was ruling but it was also serving. You were serving God because he's the owner of it all. So I believe in heaven, it's still God's dwelling place. That's still his heaven. Okay, we just get to enjoy it. We get to be a joint heir with Jesus. We don't own heaven. We never will own heaven. God owns it. Everybody with me on that? We just get to be there. And what job he has, what ministry he has for us in um, 
managing that, it'll be exciting to see. A lot of it will depend on what you did with this life, okay, and what you manage in your own life, starting with your own life. How good of a manager are you of your own life? How good of a manager are you with the gifts God's given you? What are you doing with it? What are you doing with your sphere of influence? What, do you, what ministry are you doing, whether it's in the church or outside of the church? We all have a responsibility, okay, uh, that God's given us. So are you taking advantage of those God moments that God brings you, whether it's to talk to one person or to have a platform and talk to many? This person wrote, arrogance is a negative form of leadership. I could not agree more. Absolutely. But remember, heaven is about gaining. Okay, when I do that, I'm pointing to the screen. Y'all can help me out here. Heaven's about gaining, not losing. So what do we lose when we go to heaven? Selfishness, pride, arrogance, ego. We lose all that. Does that mean we can't lead anymore? No. Because arrogance and leadership are not synonymous. I've known phenomenal leaders who are absolutely the antithesis of arrogance. And then I've known people who were full of themselves in leadership positions, and so have you. We all have. So you you can't marry those two. Just because a leader is arrogant doesn't mean leadership requires arrogance. So can we lead in heaven? Can we have uh, leadership in heaven? Absolutely. We're going to. We're going to. But that doesn't mean we're going to be arrogant. Okay, it's only God that exalts us, okay? Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and what? He will lift you up. Guys, ministry is about humbling yourself and being used of God. It's God that elevates you to your position. Would you agree with that? Okay? So, if God, if God exalts you to a place, um, then you better use that platform. Look what he did. Look what he's done throughout history. He's exalted men and women in human history to high places. What have they done with it? They've used it for his kingdom's purpose. If Dr. Billy Graham were sitting in here in front of us, would you think he's arrogant? But yet he's probably touched more lives of any modern-day person than anybody we could think of. Okay? He's dined with presidents and royalty and had the opportunity to speak to a countless millions of people for over half a century. That doesn't mean he's arrogant. God put him there, and he used it for God. So I believe the same thing happens in heaven. Okay, then this, the, the path changes to parenting. And um, parenting uh, is about procreating, teaching, raising children. Um, it's a huge part of many of our lives here on earth. Now, this person writes, since parenting children was a result of the fall of man, therefore, is it correct to assume there will be no children in heaven? Well, there's a problem with the question because parenting is not a result of the fall of man, okay? Parenting is a blessing. Would you all agree with that? Okay, God created Adam and Eve. Okay, Adam and Eve procreated and had Cain and Abel. When Adam and Eve, when Eve gave birth, a 30-year-old Cain didn't pop out and say, okay, I'm going to go find my wife now. Okay? They had to be parents. Okay? Parenting is not a result of the fall. The negative aspects that we deal with in parenting, and that's probably where the writer of this question was going with, corrective behavior or correcting behavior, dealing with adolescence, you know, some of the attitudes that we can deal with in our children. Yes, some of those things that you deal with in your, in your children absolutely are a result of the fall. But parenting which according to the Bible's definition is training and teaching and disciplining, is not a result of the fall as much as a a privilege. I think the question would be the sub-question that's not really being asked, but I can hear the person asking the question based on my answer saying, okay, well, if man had never sinned, wouldn't wouldn't parenting parenting have looked much different? Yes, it would have. It probably would have just incorporated teaching life skills, and, and teaching God's law, okay? It probably would have done without all the attitude you have to deal with, amen? But now that is a result of the fall, and I think that's where this person was going. So then the question is, is it correct to assume there'll be no children in heaven? I believe we'll all be childlike, and I'm talking about innocence and things like that. Um, will there be little kids running around? Um, could be, but I think children grow in heaven, I think even right now there are children, children that are aborted, children that die untimely. Uh, I believe they continue to grow, and I told you all that last week about the story with Tilly and all that. Again, if you're asking what does the final product look like, how will we finally look uh, all after a million years of, the, of being on the new earth, I can't answer that. The Bible doesn't say it, and I don't know. Okay? 
Um, many of us enjoyed raising children, etc. cetera. Um, all this is done on earth. Is it in vain what we've done with our children? No. Not even without eternal recognition or joy. No, because we don't parent for recognition. We parent out of obedience. Um, so the parenting that we've enjoyed on earth, hopefully you've looked at it as a privilege. Okay? And again, not that it was always pleasurable. But if you've coached a team, it's not always pleasurable, right? Especially when you lose. But is it? But it, does it still bring you joy or can it? Absolutely. Especially if you enjoy seeing people go from not doing well to doing very well. And those of us that enjoy teaching, we like seeing the light bulbs come on. We like those teachable moments. So I believe our parenting that we did on earth, just like being a spouse here on earth, um, it is not in vain. Okay? It's going to look different in heaven because it has a different purpose in heaven than it had on earth because in heaven there is no sin. Okay. Question is... Will we stop learning in heaven? Will we need to teach Bible studies in heaven? Probably not in the way you think, okay? But I, will there be a need for uh, proclamation of God's goodness and God's, uh, God's word? Could be. Not in a sense of convincing people to believe, but maybe in the sense of do we not edify and build up each other with God's word? So why wouldn't we do that in heaven? Okay? Jesus spoke uh, God's word to comfort his disciples. So I think in heaven... God's word will be more of your source of certainly comfort and inspiration and, and encouraging others. Hopefully you're doing that on, on earth. When I quote scripture, I'm not always teaching. I'm reminding. Matter of fact, I've said a large part of my job, especially in the counseling arena, is not teaching new concepts. It's reminding people what they already know. Okay? So if somebody's having a down, you know, a faith crisis, and I come along and say, remember, God loves you. Okay? I come along and say, you know, you can do all things through Christ who is your strength. I'm not teaching you a new concept. I'm reminding you of what God's word says. Will there be that need in heaven? Could be. But not in a sense of teaching your principle you don't know as much as just saying, hey, I just want you to know I love you. Maybe we edify and build up each other with God's word. Okay? Um, women are to train and teach children and other women. Is it going to be the same way in heaven? Men and women are created equal. Um, is it then safe to assume there will be that there will be two sexes in heaven. Yes, humans are humans on earth. Humans will be humans in heaven. Okay? What's one of the things that distinguish you as a human being on earth? Your sexuality. Your gender. Okay? I'm a man on earth. I better be a man in heaven. <laughs> if not, we got to have a talk, right? God, I love you and all, but uh, anyway. So, yes, I believe we maintain our gender identity. Absolutely. Um. This person asked about no good thing will be destroyed in heaven. Define good things. I think creation is good. It's not my definition. God pronounced all creation what? Good. So I believe that um, in heaven, God's creation will be restored and renewed and resurrected, and it'll be pronounced good. You and I, were very good. Okay? But this carries over into being a fan of space and a lover of activity on earth, uh, will be, we be able to explore in environments? Um, what about the, the things that confine us now? You know, the, the limitations of space and atmosphere and, and water and coal mines with poisonous gases, etc. I don't know. I can't really give you a good answer. Here's what I can say. Principle number one, heaven is about gaining, not losing. And principle number two, anything that's not a result of the fall can be carried over. Okay. Are toxic gases given off in a cave a result of the fall? I don't know. I'll leave that up to God. Okay? Um, but here's what I know. In heaven, we'll have the ability to explore where we want to explore. We'll have the knowledge to stay away from things that maybe we need to stay away from. Okay? Uh, how will we cope with the extremes of weather? Well, that's supposing that we're going to have weather extremes in heaven. We don't even know that. Are we going to have weather patterns in heaven? Yes. Are they going to be extreme? Well, we then have to define extreme. Okay? Um, so if you live in Seattle, rain is not extreme. If you live in the desert, rain is extreme. So you have to define extreme, first of all. Then you have to define coping. Because there are people that climb Mount Everest. Okay? There are people that dress and train to go live in the Antarctic. Okay? There are other people that would stay as far away from that environment as possible. So in heaven, do I believe all of God's creation will be represented? Yes. That doesn't mean I want to necessarily go plant, 
you know, my eternal self in Antarctica in heaven. Okay? I don't like cold weather. If I don't like it in heaven or on earth, I'm probably not going to like it in heaven. If God has provided that environment, I will, I'll take the Caribbean environment, okay? <laughs> because, listen, there's going to be plenty of people who stay away from that balmy environment and enjoy the Antarctic and everything in between. So, again, if the question is, will we be able to avoid, will we be able to dress appropriately, will we be able to be trained in or, or adapt to, sure, if that's, if that's your deal and you want to do that, go for it, Okay? What about rats and roaches and, and rodents? Let me just answer it real quickly. All of, principle number two, okay? Anything that's not a result of the fall can be carried over into heaven. God's purpose for them in heaven may be different. And down here on earth, you and I, we're so influenced by our culture. We're so influenced by our tradition. If you grew up in a home where uh, rats ran around all the time, if you grew up in a culture, let me put it that way, where rodents roamed freely, then rodents are not freaky. If you grew up in an environment where snakes roamed in and out your house, your parents had pet snakes, or you had pet snakes and you handled them, and then they don't freak you out. If you grew up in a home where, if you grew up on a ranch, okay, then cow dung doesn't bother you, okay? If you grew up in New York City, cow dung bothers you, roaches bother you, snakes bother you. My point is, isn't it safe to say that we're affected by our growing up and our background? So we carry a certain amount of that into heaven. When we go to heaven, it's not about losing, it's about gaining. Maybe we'll gain a different perspective of rats and roaches. Okay? And maybe their little creepy bodies will be resurrected, and they'll stay away from us. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, this person asked about Greek mythology and the characters that we read in Greek mythology. Is it a, is it a possibility that that's the fallen angels that procreated with human humans uh, mentioned in Genesis? Uh, no, I, I think for everything God has in his word, Satan has a counterfeit. Um, so, no, I believe what's mentioned in Scripture are fallen angels, okay, that took on human form. Even the men of Sodom and Gomorrah wanted to have sex with the angels that were guarding Lot. So angels can take on human form and even be pleasing to uh, be the lustful object of, of human beings. We see that in God's word. But I don't believe there was Greek mythology, that there was really Zeus and mercury and, and all this okay um that's a whole nother discussion but i believe it's just done nothing but distort a lot of god's truths okay that was a very polytheistic greek certainly the greeks very polytheistic and jesus dealt with it in his day and so did the jewish people okay even with the gnostics that we well we, won't, we don't have time to go into all that but jesus dealt with all that but no i don't believe that's biblical truth um this person wrote about uh, application of human characteristics to non-human things. Jesus wept as an expression of emotion. Where else do we see the Godhead or God, God, the Father, expressing emotions? The entire Old Testament. God saw creation, saw sin, he was angry. God was going to destroy. Noah said, God, please don't do it. God changed his mind. So we see relationship. We see prayer works. We see anger. We see hurt. We see sadness. You know, we see um, compassion. The Bible says God is uh, full of love and mercy and compassion. And the word compassion there means to show pity. It's a verb, okay? So God shows pity based on an emotion. I think God's emotions are all throughout. Psalm 116, the Bible says that um, uh, God is, uh, well, what does it say? I made a note. Uh, God has anger. God has sadness. He's love. Um, he's full of compassion. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Psalm 116.5 says God is full of compassion. That's the word I was looking at. Um, when God looked at the sin of his people, he dealt with it. He judged it. Okay? When God looks at our sin, he's dealt with it. He's judged it. Jesus died on the cross. That's a judgment. Jesus paid for our sin. So I really think throughout the entire Bible, um, we see emotions of God. 1 Corinthians 13 reminds us what love is. And 1 John tells us God is love. And when love is patient and kind and long-suffering and doesn't hold record of wrong, it's not, you know, so those are all things that God is. So that's another place in Scripture where we see what God is. Okay. Um, if heaven is about losing, uh, losing nothing and gaining everything, is it a Bible verse? No, that's not a Bible verse. Here's where I get that. Philippians 1.21 says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's where I get that, Philippians 1.21. Okay, that's where I get principle number one. Okay, um, 
Okay. Let me just real quick make sure I'm getting everything. The, the person asked about the Pangaea, the, uh, the continents being one landmass, and over time, and continental drift, and things like that. That's why we have our continents. In the new heaven and the new earth, will the new earth be one large mass? Uh, some have speculated that that was God's way of, of keeping evil from spreading, etc. Um, I don't know. Here's what I know. Anything that's not a result of the fall can carry out or carry over to the new world. We're not told in Scripture that, that the continents drifted and separated okay, because of man's sin. Um, so what does the new land mass look like on the new earth? I don't know. None of us do. Scripture doesn't say. Um, it, it referenced in the law of God in Exodus chapter 12 that your servants, your livestock, your foreigners living among you um, were to not do any work. Who were the foreigners? Were they slaves? No. The word foreigner there in Exodus 12 is also the word alien. It's also the word sojourner, and it means one traveling through. Okay, in, in this culture, they didn't have hotels. And so as people traveled from culture, to, from region to region, they would stay with people. A family friend, friend of a friend, or sometimes just cold turkey knock on a door, you know. Um, and, uh, and that carried out even into Jesus' disciples. That's why Jesus said, you know, don't take anything with you. Go from house to house. So that's who the foreigners are. It just means alien, person who's not of your ethnic background. And then, um, last question, God instructing animals, God instructing Adam to name the animals. Was it for identification? Was it to build a relationship? Yes and yes. Um, is this an ownership? No, because God is the owner and we are his managers. This person cited naming a cat, even though that's your cat. I understand that, but when God gave that responsibility to man, um, again, it was under the guise of manage my creation. So we were never created, nor will we ever be created, to be the owners of what God is. He's the owner. The earth is the Lord and everything. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Amen? Okay, so we're his managers. Okay. Whew. Awesome questions. And if I did not answer your question satisfactor, uh, satisfactorily, factory, can't even speak now. If I didn't answer it the way you wanted me to, um, Please email me again, and, or if you just want to have a more detailed discussion, but not tonight. Because I'm just going to go, uh. All right, but if you want to have a more detailed discussion, we can. Email works best because I have time to think and look and, and not just give you an answer uh, to, to, you know, give you an answer. Fair enough? Awesome questions. I love you guys, man. Those are phenomenal questions. Now, I'm going to ask you something. Thank you for watching online. We're going to stop the filming right now, but thank you for watching. I hope you've hung in there with us. God bless you. Hope you've enjoyed this Heaven uh, series. Take care. Mm -hmm.